It's a great privilege to welcome uh, Dr. James Hall, uh, who is one of the founding members of the American Academy of Audiology and uh, a legend in the field of audiology. He's currently a professor at Salish University in the University of Hawaii. And so he is uh, gracious enough to give us a lecture this morning on uh, auditory uh, spectrum disorder. So Dr. Hall, thank you very much and appreciate it. Thank you, Bill. Well, it is a pleasure to uh, speak <coughs> to all of you, wherever you are, including those of you who are listening to this as a recording and weren't here for the live presentation. Um, I've always been in a uh, department of otolaryngology from the very beginning. I got my PhD <coughs> of all the times so I'm suddenly got a tickle in my throat. PhD at Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, <coughs> and um, I know that otolaryngologists are on the front line as well as audiologists in detecting children and adults with any type of hearing problem, any type of auditory disorder. <clears throat> and traditionally, um, there has been some confusion about these two problems that I'm talking about today, auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder and auditory processing disorder. <clears throat> uh, they're very underdiagnosed. Uh, in fact, probably the majority of people in the world, certainly uh, outside the United States, but even in the United States, the, they go undiagnosed. And both APD, I'll use that abbreviation, and ANSD, can create incredible communication problems. In children, APD and uh, ANSD can basically <clears throat> interfere with normal speech and language development and, and, and essentially um, interfere with academic performance to the point where many uh, students will drop out. They simply can't uh, succeed, they can't read. Uh, but even in adults, auditory processing disorders can be very debilitating keep a person from working regularly or working in the position they should be in. Uh, and often sometimes uh, for older teenagers and young adults, get them in big trouble because they're so frustrated about the communication problem, they, they uh, very often end up in juvenile detention centers or even prison. So <clears throat> these are two important problems and I'm going to keep this very basic, very clinically oriented, very practical. You can give you the information you need to identify who's at risk for these problems, how they should be evaluated, and also the good news that there's lot to, lots we can do for them. The intervention's very effective. So I'm gonna keep an eye on, uh, on the clock so we finish on time and have a little time for questions and answers at the end. I'm gonna just remind everyone first about a very important principle in audiology. Uh, it was originally um, focused on children, pediatric audiology, but it really applies to everybody. Uh, and that's the cross-check principle. And these two people, uh, my mentor, James Jurger, when I was at Baylor College of Medicine, and my colleague, Deborah Hayes, who was there then, and she's been a colleague ever since. This is when I were talking to mid-1970s. All, they, along with all of us in the clinic at that time, realized that some patients were being misdiagnosed. They were coming in uh, with the diagnosis of uh, severe hearing loss, but then we'd find out they had normal hearing or vice versa. They'd come in and uh, everybody thought they had normal hearing and it turns out they had a very serious hearing loss. <clears throat> and uh, so the cross-check principle was uh, developed and uh, articulated, published in the Archives of Otolaryngology in 1976, uh, well over 40 years ago. And basically back then, the test battery was somewhat limited. Uh, in the general clinic, everybody, most clinics in the United States, behavioral audiometry was all that people did, pure tone speech audiometry. So when you get into infants and young children, pe people, anybody with cognitive impairment, you start running into some serious problems with uh, inaccurate information. So Jim Jurger and uh, Deborah Hayes and the rest of us were using impedance measurements regularly at that time. They were new, uh, just a few years old, but we're using them both tympanometry and acoustic reflexes, at least contralateral reflexes. Ipsilateral reflexes were technically impossible back then. We also had ABR. It was brand new. Most places had no access to it. Most people had not even heard about it at that point. Um, and we were using it in the clinic as a routine procedure for any patient young child or anyone else really, who couldn't be fully evaluated with behavioral audiometry. 
Well, the cross-check principle is very simple. If you rely on behavioral test results exclusively, you're going to make mistakes. And the mistakes are going to lead to misdiagnosis or lack of diagnosis and mismanagement. And sometimes that can be very, very serious. In fact, most of the times it is. So the principle is don't ever accept the results of one test, a single test, particularly a behavioral test, until you've backed up or confirmed or cross-checked those results with an independent test that provides totally different information on the auditory system. And I have adhered to this principle over the years and most audiologists should. And this principle, as I said, extends beyond children to any patient we see in the clinic. Well, nowadays our test battery has expanded tremendously. We not only have still have behavioral audiometry, we now have OAEs. Uh, we don't just have acoustic reflexes in the contralateral condition, we have ipsy and contra reflexes. We don't just have air click, uh, click evoked ABRs, air and bone, we also have tone bursting, chirp stimulation. Uh, we also have ASSR, of course we have ECOG, we have cortical evoked responses. So now we should use any procedures, any tests, which we need to in any given patient to get the most accurate and early diagnosis we possibly can. Now, I've written um, on the 40th anniversary of the cross-check principle, I wrote a, a review article, which is, you can see here, and you're welcome to contact me by email if you'd like a copy. It gets into much more detail <clears throat> on this very, very important concept in clinical audiology. Very quickly now, I'm going to go through uh, these topics that you see here, and I'm going to first talk about APD and then ANSD, and cer certain cases I'll first talk about ANSD and then APD, but I'll always compare the two types of disorders relative to the topic we're discussing. So let's talk a little bit about the anatomy, the pathophysiology, and the sites of dysfunction for both of these disorders. Let's start with APD. And I put the little C in front of APD because we're going to be more focusing here on the central nervous system aspect of APD. Now, in my opinion, APD, auditory processing disorders, can occur anywhere in the auditory system, not just the brain. But we're going to focus on the brain uh, etiologies and the brain sites of disorder for APD. Um, they're primarily in the, in the major auditory pathways, the fast um, super highway pathways, you might say, within the auditory system. The auditory nerve, the major axons going from one center to the other from the brain stem. So we're talking about inferior colliculus uh, all the way up to the thalamus and then primary auditory cortex. And research clearly shows using functional MRI, MRI with ABR, behavioral tests, uh, even post-mortem analyses of brains that some people have disorders in hearing that are related to poor processing in these central auditory pathways. And they can be children or they can be adults. ANSD is more of a peripheral phenomenon, not central. Now, there may be patients who with ANSD who also have problems in their central nervous system, but that's not part of the diag diagnosis. So here we're talking about inner hair cell problems, but not just a sensory inner hair cell loss. A disruption in inner hair cell function where the inner hair cells are not releasing the neurotransmitters as they should. Then Another site of dysfunction is the actual synapse between the inner hair cells and the auditory nerve afferent fibers. And then of course, the auditory nerve itself as implied by the term auditory neuropathy. So there are very two very different sites of dysfunction. I don't say sites of lesion because in many of these cases, in fact, most of them, there's no tumor. Uh, there's no obvious, there's certainly no neoplasm of any type, but there is dysfunction. Now, let me just go on for a moment more about ANSD. Um, there are some excellent uh, review articles now, and I recommend this to you. It's uh, by Arnold Starr, who's kind of the, the big name in, in auditory neuropathy, one of them, and uh, Gary Rance, who is an audiologist in Melbourne, Australia. And this is actually a, a, a drawing that uh, Arnold Starr drew. He's a, an amateur uh, a retired neurologist and an amateur artist. And basically it shows two fundamental sites of dysfunction for ANSD. 
An otolaryngologist and audiologist must differentiate these two sites in the diagnosis. One is presynaptic and one is postsynaptic. The presynaptic person with, auto, with uh, auditory neuropathy almost always benefits from hearing aids. I mean, well, hearing aids and also cochlear implants. The cochlear implant or the hearing aid essentially does what the inner hair cell should be doing. And a cochlear implant very often in a patient with presynaptic ANSD can be incredibly beneficial. The postsynaptic etiology or, or type site of dysfunction uh, it involves either the synapse itself and or the synapse and the nerve. And many of these patients do not benefit from cochlear implants and many don't benefit from hearing aids. So the site of dysfunction and the diagnosis of ANSD directly impacts how that patient's going to be managed. Okay, real quick historical perspective and I, I, I'm gonna try to keep from going on and on because it's a fascinating uh, story really, but let's start out with APD. It uh, marked the beginning of interest in central auditory functioning, auditory processing in the brain. We have to go back to the 50s. This is, this is not a recent concept of development. And this is one of the most fascinating stories really. Um, a group of otolaryngologists who really never did any more hearing research after this, these first few articles, a group of otolaryngologists in Milan, Italy, found patients coming into their clinic who had normal audiograms and horrible complaints about hearing and communication problems. And uh, to make a long story short, they discovered that some of these patients, most of them had some type of tumor in the temporal lobe of the brain, the auditory regions of the brain. So they very, were very clever. This was pre-digital era, well, long before computers. They filtered some high frequencies, analog filtering, high frequencies out of some Italian words. And then they presented these words to both normal hearing people, no problems with their brain or ears, and these patients that they had with temporal lobe tumors. And the patients with the temporal lobe tumors simply couldn't repeat back these filtered words where the high frequencies were removed whereas the people with normal hearing had no problem. This generated incredible interest around the world that there were, number one, there were per people with problems in hearing that were related to the central nervous system and also that they could be detected with a simple clinical test. Now at the same time, in fact, ironically, the same year in 1954, a psychologist at Northwestern University, Helmer Michael Bust, also was beginning to be very interested and central auditory processing. In fact, he was advising audiologists and others to always consider the central nervous system whenever evaluating a patient with hearing problems. Now, interestingly, James Jurger, my mentor, was a student at the time at Northwestern. He got his master's and PhD there, well, all of his degrees there. And he was uh, going to clinics with Dr. Michael Bust. And uh, for the first time, he, he began to appreciate that you didn't have to have a hearing loss on an audiogram to have some serious hearing problems. And uh, he passed that uh, perspective on to me as when I was his student. And so for all of my career over 40 years, I've always focused both on the ear and the brain. You really haven't evaluated hearing unless you've evaluated auditory processing. Well, this word got out pretty quickly and other audiologists, Jack Katz, James Jurger, Bob Keith, all made big contributions to the evaluation of APD and the management. Uh, Jack Cax developed a dichotic test, a dichotic listening test, which is still very popular. He developed it in the early 1960s. Jim Jurger took a bunch of different tests of central auditory functioning, speech test, ABR, cortical evoked responses, put them into a test battery and published his results throughout the 70s. Uh, he documented or validated these tests with people who had known central nervous system uh, pathologies. And then Bob Keith, who spent his, most of his career at the University of Cincinnati, uh, developed numerous APD tests. So by the 1990s, uh, APD was pretty well established. Now the 1990s is the decade of the brain. And so at that point, there was not only interest in APD from a clinical point of view, but there was quite a bit of auditory neuroscience. And Frank Music, who's photograph is on the far right on the slide, uh, really was a pioneer in, in using auditory evoked responses and additional auditory processing tests to diagnose and manage APD. So as I said, 
in the decade of the brain, the 1990s, there was an explosion of, of, audit, of neuroscience in general, but also auditory neuroscience. The whole concept of brain plasticity was really uh, developed and, and confirmed then. Functional MRI and other incredible uh, techniques for evaluating central nervous system function were developed. Um, and of course, in audiology, this information filtered down to both hearing scientists, but also uh, aud clinical audiologists who are actually seeing these patients. And now if you were to do a PubMed search for APD, you'd come up with over 5,000 peer reviewed articles. So we know a lot about APD and it's got a long and, and very quite interesting history. Audi APD assessment is now well within our scope of practice as audiologists. And every otolaryngologist should be familiar with APD, should appreciate the risk factors for APD in children and adults, and should be able to counsel patients and parents that we know a lot about this problem, we can diagnose it, and we can effectively intervene. Now let's turn our attention to the historical perspective for ANSD for just a moment. It's also fascinating. Technically, we would really should have been able to diagnose it ANSD and appreciated existed way back in the 30s and 40s. ECOG, electrocochleography, was the first of all of the auditory evoked responses to be discovered in 1930. Um, and obviously ECOG, as you all know, evaluates outer hair cell, uh, inner hair cell function, outer hair cell function, and auditory nerve function. So ECOG is giving us information on function in a part of the auditory system where we would suspect to find, expect to find ANSD. Unfortunately, for many, many years, from the 1930 paper all the way up uh, until quite recently, ECOG was for the most part recorded using needles placed through the eardrum, which is a great technique, trans-tympanic tympanometry, uh, I mean, uh, ECOG measurements, trans-tympanic tympanic, uh, measurements of ECOG, or, the other technique was developed uh, at Baylor College of Medicine by Alfred Coates, and it was an ear canal electrode, but very uncomfortable and, uh, and not very popular. So my point is that even though ECOG existed and it was being used in the lab, very few clinical audiologists were recording ECOG um, over the years because it was invasive and very, very um, difficult to record from a technical point of view. So, so we really weren't looking at ECOG uh, over the years when we should have been identifying ANSD. Well, along came ABRs discovered in um, our first report in 1971. Uh, Don Jewett actually published the paper, but his mentor, Robert Lambos, um, really had uh, identified that there were brainstem evoked responses after ECOG and before the cortical responses. And as soon as audiologists heard about ABR, they went gravitated to it and they totally forgot about ECOG if they'd ever really been interested in ECOG. Because here we have a non-invasive way of evaluating auditory function in infants, young children, and anybody who can't participate behaviorally. Well, as ABR began to be used clinically in the 70s and into the 80s, a uh, number of researchers started to point out some very unusual and, uh, you know, unexplained results. They'd say cochlear function seems to be normal, but there's no brainstem response. Now, how can there be a brain, uh, no brainstem response when there's cochlear function? We would expect there to be normal function for both if the cochlea is normal. And then there was another report by Don Worthington, who's shown here, who was at the Boys, uh, Boys Town Institute and Research Hospital in uh, Nebraska, saying, here we have a patient with hearing, and then they have no ABR. What's going on here? Is it an error? Uh, how do we get this paradoxical combination of findings? So people were beginning to identify what we now know as auditory neuropathy. Then along came OAEs. They were first discovered in 1978. And by the late 80s and early 1990s, most audiologists and research centers had access to OEEs. Now the report started popping up literally just about every journal of every article, uh, every, every journal of uh, would, every year, every issue would have uh, an article. And the, the basic story was, here's a patient with OAEs. They seem to be normal, but they have no ABR. Here's a patient with normal OAEs, but they, they seem to be deaf. 
they have no response on pure drone audiometry. And so there were these, these reports of unusual findings uh, that couldn't be explained. Patient with hearing loss, and yet their outer hair cells seem to be functioning well. Everybody kind of assumed if the outer hair cells were functioning well, there was probably going to be reasonably good hearing. Well, along came Arnold Starr. And Arnold Starr was a neurologist and he started collecting these patients, who some of them whom had other cranial neuropathies. And he coined the term auditory neuropathy. And this was in the early 1990s. So I was at the Vanderbilt University at the time. I was a director of audiology and I was in the Department of Otorongology and the Division of Hearing and Speech Sciences. And of course, it's a major medical center. So we were seeing patients who were at risk for auditory neuropathy, even though we didn't know the term at the time and really didn't uh, know that they were there. And this is my first patient, 1997, a very premature infant who survived, um, very fortunately, low, low birth weight, 950 grams, had two risk factors uh, that we now know are very closely associated with auditory neuropathy, the very low birth weight and hyperbilirubinemia. She also had risk factors for peripheral hearing loss, ototoxic medications. Well, to make a long story short, I still remember this case vividly because I couldn't get an ABR out of her no matter what I did. I tested her at 40 weeks and yet her OAEs, which at that point were kind of a new phenomenon, they were perfectly normal. So here's her ABR. Now in retrospect, I was seeing some bumps at the beginning of the tracing, as you can see here, which were cochlear microphonic. I didn't realize it at the time. Uh, and then over on the right, we see normal OAEs. Now, of course, I ended up making the diagnosis with this patient because by 1993, everybody was seeing these kinds of patients and we're beginning to realize how we could diagnose auditory neuropathy. This young lady, it turns out, this little girl, ended up having normal hearing sensitivity. So that's actually one of the patterns for auditory neuropathy. neuropathy. No ABR, but normal hearing sensitivity. Well, very soon, through the 90s and up till now, many, many people discovered that auditory neuropathy was uh, worldwide. In fact, there are certain parts of the world, the Middle East, for example, and southeastern India that have very high proportion of patients with auditory neuropathy. Because we now realize half of all patients with auditory neuropathy have actually a genetic component. So now much more is known about auditory neuropathy throughout the world. And every otolaryngologist and every audiologist should always suspect or at least consider the possibility of auditory neuropathy in every new, newly identified child with a hearing loss. Okay, we're gonna go right on now to uh, how we should evaluate uh, and how we should manage auditory neuropathy in APD. But we don't need to um, go to the literature necessarily and do a literature review ourselves. Fortunately, there are now clinical practice guidelines for both of these disorders. So um, for APD, the American Academy of Audiology uh, had a, assigned a task force to develop clinical practice guidelines for APD and uh, those were published in peer reviewed and then published in 2010. I was on that task force. Uh, those are still in the United States, the most comprehensive guidelines for evaluating and managing APD. Uh, the British audiologists are also involved in this. They have their own set of guidelines. And then of course, APD is recognized around the world. There are guidelines in other countries. The most recent are the New Ze Zealand guidelines, 2019. So any audiologist or any otolaryngologist who wants to know about more about APD and wants to get a kind of a crash course on APD should just take, get a hold of these guidelines, download them, read them, and you'll have a pretty good understanding of how to evaluate and how to manage APD. And not only that, if you are involved in APD assessment and management, you'll be following standard of care. Now we also have clinical practice guidelines for ANSD. Uh, the document shown on the left here was published in our, around 2009, 2010, uh, and basically uh, was commissioned by Deborah Hayes, who I already have mentioned, the cross-check principal author, co-author. And this uh, document was put together by a who's who list of experts on ANSD, including Arnold Starr. 
and Chuck Berlin and others. So that's an excellent set of guidelines, uh, but also different guidelines exist in different countries. So the guideline on the right uh, came out a little bit later uh, is also very, very good for assessment and management of ANSD. And of course, as audiologists and otolaryngologists in the United States, we can really refer to guidelines from anywhere in the world. Standard of care is really standard of care no matter where you are. Okay, we're gonna move right into risk factors. And this is, we're not gonna spend much time, but it's a very important part of the lecture because most of you are not going to be uh, re involved, or I should say not gonna be responsible entirely for the diagnosis and management of APD or the diagnosis and management of ANSD. But you may be expected to at least recognize who's at risk. If you're in a busy otolaryngology clinic as an otologist, neurotologist, or even a general otolaryngologist, or if you're a, an audiologist in a children's hospital or maybe a, uh, in a clinic where you dispense hearing aids mostly to adults, you are seeing patients with ANSD and you're seeing patients with APD, whether you know it or not. So you're really obligated to at least recognize which patients are more likely to have one of these disorders and to make a proper referral if need be. Now for children, the risk factors are pretty well, clearly defined. Most children with APD have what's called developmental APD. There's a disruption in their neurobiological development affecting the central nervous system. Now there are exceptions to that. For example, a child with a head injury severe head injury, who was in coma. But most children with APD have no um, obvious etiology in their history. They haven't, haven't had a head injury. They've had not had a tumor or, or anything else affecting their central nervous system. So the risk factors are, are really based on history. Uh, anytime you have a child who was born prematurely, perhaps suffered from asphyxia, uh, hypoxia, hy uh, it, uh, either an ischemic incident or hypoxia, cytomegalovirus, of course I said head injury, or anybody who's got any neurological symptoms like seizure disorders is at great risk for APD. Chronic otitis media throughout the preschool years, which is not properly managed medically and surgically, uh, and which results in intermittent and chronic conductive hearing loss is a big risk factor for APD, easily obtained from history. Any child who's starting out school, they're in kindergarten, first, second grade, and they're just not doing well. They keep getting hearing tests. They always come back, normal audiogram, normal audiogram. That child is at great risk for APD. APD runs in families. There's no question about that. So if you have older siblings of a child who have not done well in school, suspect APD in the younger children. Then I'm gonna quickly run through some coexisting disorders. All of them put a child at risk for APD. And anytime you have any patient, child or an adult, who's continually complaining about a hearing loss and yet the audiogram keeps coming back normal, uh, by, it's just logical. You're gonna say, well, maybe it's not the ear. Maybe it's the central nervous system and you need to evaluate for APD. Here are the coexisting disorders with APD in children. And the research shows that only about maybe 20% or not even 20%, one out of five children has pure APD. In other words, that's the only problem they have. The, the majority of children with APD also have one or two other problems. And these are the most common. Specific language impairment, learning disabilities, reading disorders, and of course, peripheral hearing loss. So anytime you have a patient with one or more of these coexisting disorders, at least suspect APD. Now in adults, of course, APD can occur in persons of all age. In adults, one type of APD would be an adult who had it as a child and it was never diagnosed. But then there are also acquired etiologies or acquired forms of APD in adults. For example, advancing age. We know that the aging process can affect the brain as well as the ears. Um, and we also know there's a very close, close correlation between cognitive decline in adults and hearing loss, particularly speech perception and noise and other auditory processing deficits. So that's a risk factor alone, advancing age. Complaints of auditory, I don't know why that jumped ahead, <clears throat> complaints of auditory problems that go far beyond what you're expecting from the patient's audiogram. Immediately think of APD. 
And then I'll just focus here on the medical disorders and diseases. Anytime you have a patient who has some type of neurological insult, neurological disease or disorder, consider APD and of course, traumatic brain injury. Okay, now let's talk about ANSD and risk factors. Well, they're very well defined. Um, the risk factors include perinatal diseases. I've already mentioned hyperbilirubinemia, hypoxia, ischemia, prematurity, neurologic disorders, as you see here, de demyelinating disorders, uh, for example. But I wanna point something out here. These are risk factors for APD, but very often the APD, or I mean uh, for ANSD, but the, very often the ANSD is first suspected before you even know the child has a risk factor. Audiologists who are performing newborn hearing screenings and early uh, diagnostic assessments on infants under the age of six months often see this unusual pattern of normal OAEs and abnormal ABR, no ABR, or normal OAEs and absent acoustic reflexes and immediately suspect ANSD and then make the referral to neurology, otolaryngology, other specialists, and then the diagnosis uh, is made for one of these disorders. So audiologists and otolaryngologists have a very, very unique opportunity here to get a jump on an accurate diagnosis for a very serious disease affecting the central nervous system by properly recognizing the pattern for ANSD as soon as possible. Here are some other risk factors for ANSD in children. There are genetic, as I mentioned already, roughly 50% of children with ANSD have a genetic component. Uh, and that's important to recognize, and that's where we need to get medical genetics involved always in the assessment. Um, and then there are other neurological disorders, neurodegenerative disorders that can be associated also with an AS ANSD. So for ANSD, we can either use the risk factors to, attend, to uh, um, find out which children might have ANSD, or we can use the pattern for ANSD we see from simple screening techniques <laughs> to determine uh, who might have a neurological disorder that's related to ANSD. Now, if you look at all of the risk factors for ANSD, and here we have a relatively recent study listing some of them, <clears throat> this will really help you to determine which children you're evaluating in the clinic need to be evaluated for APD by an audio, uh, for ANSD by an audiologist. So prematurity, <clears throat> jaundice, for right up at the top of the list. Uh, in fact, any child, uh, any infant, who is a graduate of an intensive care nursery uh, should be considered at risk. Real quickly, the prevalence of ANSD is far higher than we thought, particularly when we get into children with hearing loss. And I've highlighted one point there. <coughs> Roughly 15% of children with severe to profound hearing loss have ANSD as an etiology. Um, so my policy has always been suspect ANSD and every child who's coming in for their first hearing assessment or maybe perhaps following a newborn hearing screening failure, suspect it until you rule it out. <clears throat> now the test battery for diagnosis of these two problems. Well, the test battery is comprehensive, <clears throat> but it doesn't have to take a lot of time. So let's focus first on uh, APD. We're gonna use a comprehensive test battery, behavioral test, follow cross-check principle, <coughs> excuse me, objective tests, it's definitely OAEs, Ipsy contra reflexes, and ABR if, as, ne as necessary. Our first goal is to either prove that there's a peripheral hearing problem involving the ear or the auditory nerve, in most cases the ear, or rule it out. Then, once we've done that, and that only took about a half an hour, if there's uh, normal hearing sensitivity or some degree of hearing at least, not a profound loss, we move in to testing auditory processes. And four or five auditory processes have been identified over the years. One is temporal auditory processing. How well does the child or the patient's uh, auditory system uh, and how quickly does it process information? How efficiently? 
depth as a process information. And there are numerous tests that we can use. We don't use all of these tests. <clears throat> so in an APD assessment, typically I'll just use one of them. I'll use, uh, or, or two of them, maybe the gaps in, <laughs> in noise test, <coughs> pardon me, in a pitch pattern test or duration pattern. The dichotic test, again, developed way back in the 1960s, always valuable in the test battery. And they evaluate actually numerous auditory processes, temporal processing, as well as uh, some auditory memory skills. Then the test, the so-called test of monaural low redundancy speech perception. And there are numerous tests, including filtered word tests, which were used by the laryngologist in Italy way back in the 1950s. Now, audiologists have access to all of these tests. Uh, most audiologists don't perform these tests routinely, but they have access to the test and many audiologists specialize in APD. There are auditory discrimination tests, that's another auditory process, and then tests of localization, lateralization, and binaural interaction. So these are how we evaluate auditory processing in both children and adults. Peripheral assessment first, then specific assessment of central auditory processing. Now for ANSD, we start out kind of with the same test battery, but remember, most of the time, we're evaluating infants or young children with ANSD. Whereas with APD, very often the patient is a young school age, preschool, late preschools, four or five years old, or elementary school age, or an adult. But with ANSD, we're actually focusing on a much younger population. So we rely much more on objective electrophysiological tests, such as OAEs, acoustic reflexes, IPSI and CONTRA, <clears throat> the ABR, very important part of the test, test battery. Sometimes the ASSR also provides important information. ECOG of all of these tests is probably the most important, very, very useful in diagnosing APD, I mean ANSD, not always necessary, but, uh, but, but very often has to be uh, employed. Cortical evoked responses sometimes, interestingly, can be recorded in patients who don't have an ABR. So that will allow us to evaluate desynchronous forms of ANSD. <clears throat> Pure tone audiometry obviously can't be recorded in an infant, but when it's feasible, maybe when they're a year, year and a half old, it should be done because some patients, including my very first patient with ANSD, had normal audiogram and other patients have absolutely no hearing. The, one of the patterns of uh, pure tone audiometry that's extremely common in ASD, ANSD by the way, is a rising hearing loss. Hearing loss in low frequencies, it looks sensory neural until you do OAEs and then of course the OAEs are normal, so you realize it's neural. So anytime you see a low frequency hearing loss in any patient, suspect ANSD. And then of course, speech audiometry is really important for diagnosing ANSD. <clears throat> and the results are incredibly uh, impressive. Even simple word recognition in quiet is almost impossible for the typical patient with auditory neuropathy. You'll see scores of 20 or 30% on word recognition in quiet for ANSD. Now, one more point. I've been talking about, <coughs> excuse me, the diagnosis of ANSD with auditory tests. But any patient suspected of ANSD really un should undergo uh, an MRI of the auditory nerve. Um, the research is quite extensive on cochlear nerve deficits, that is atrophic or absent auditory nerves in about one out of five children with ANSD. So from a diagnostic standpoint, and also a management standpoint, uh, a CT or an MRI of the auditory nerve is really, really critical um, before you reach the final diagnosis about audio auditory neuropathy. Okay, now, so we've completed the assessment, peripheral and central auditory assessment of both APD and ANSD. And for ANSD, we focused on that region of the auditory system where we suspect the problem might occur. What kinds of findings do we usually see? Well, we've already highlighted many of them. What I've done here is put together a uh, table 
which simply contrast the patterns of findings for these two disorders. And I've included all of the different procedures that we've described so far. So here, here's the point. This is a classic uh, cross-check principle concept. If you use the right test battery, a complete test battery, the, the tests that are most likely to give you information leading to the diagnosis, uh, you can very quickly differentiate APD from ANSD. The patterns of findings are distinctly different. So OAE is very often normal for both, tympanometry normal for both. But as soon as we get to acoustic reflexes, which you can record from neonates or somebody of any age, we see a difference. APD, there may be abnormalities in some patients with contralateral reflexes, but never ipsy. With ANSD, acoustic reflexes are almost always absent. So you're in a clinic, a parent's complaining about their child's speech and language development. You and the audiologist are wondering, well, what, what is uh, causing this? Is it a peripheral hearing loss? Is it a severe hearing loss? Uh, is it a conductive hearing loss? You start the basic assessment and you don't need to get any further than OAEs and acoustic reflexes and you'll be able to zero in on ANSD. At least be very suspicious. Normal OAEs, no reflexes, think ANSD. Follow that up with ECOG and now you can really begin to not only I confirm the ANSD, but find out what parts of the, uh, that peripheral auditory system are involved. ECOG findings are invariably normal in APD, if you were to do them. Of course, we don't do ECOG in APD because we don't need to. ABR is another very important way to differentiate the two problems. And um, if you, it's quite remarkable. If you have a patient who by history and their uh, complaints about hearing seem to be almost indistinguishable, two patients, but then you record ABR, the child or patient with APD, ABR is almost always normal, certainly for a simple click stimulus. The APD uh, and the ANSD patient, by definition, the ABR is absent. It's just not there. The information's not getting beyond the nerve to the brainstem. And then the final way to differentiate. So I've highlighted acoustic reflexes, ABR, and speech audiometry. The final test, very simple t test, if you can perform speech audiometry, simple word recognition and quiet, the difference is almost uh, you just can't miss it. It's just very dramatic. Normal word recognition in quiet is very typical for APD. See it in almost every patient. Horrible word recognition, very poor, 20, 25%, 30% in quiet is very typical of ANSD. So it's not hard to differentiate these two problems with even some of the more basic hearing tests. And then of course, throw in an MRI or CT scan of the auditory nerve and you've got a definitive diagnosis. Now management. Management is quite different for APD and ANSD. Um, APD management typically is occurring uh, in a clinical setting, often by an audiologist, maybe a speech pathologist, maybe a psychologist. ANSD management very often involves a larger team with more specialists. And very often the management is taking place in the context of a major medical center as opposed to a, an outpatient office. So there are some fundamental differences. So let's go into the details on how we manage each of these problems. APD management can be done by mostly audiologists, but almost all patients require the services of a speech pathologist. And in children who are suspected of ha perhaps having cognitive impairment or coexisting disorders such as ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, we need a help of a psychologist. But all of this can be done in an outpatient setting. 
Here's a child that's developed some speech and language problem, maybe normal speech and language or pretty normal, uh, who's having problems reading or having struggling in the classroom. They're generally a healthy child, but they've clearly got something something is wrong with their auditory system, something's wrong with their ability to communicate, um, but, but they're otherwise healthy. They don't have any significant disease or disorder. Counseling is critical. As audiologists, we must advocate for the parents and for the patient, both adults and children. Uh, FM technology, wearing a personal FM system uh, where the speaker has a microphone and the patient has a a receiver delivering sound directly into the ear canal, that can be extremely important. And uh, I've done quite a bit of research on that and the benefits. Adults with hearing loss who also have auditory processing deficits will benefit from hearing aids. Obviously, sounds need to be audible to be processed. <coughs> and now, 2020, there are many uh, evidence-based computer programs for auditory training. Programs that uh, are available commercially and online to develop auditory skills that the children or adults are lacking. Hearing better in speech uh, in noisy settings, for example, processing information more quickly, developing auditory discrimination, developing the ability to localize and lateralize uh, sound. Um, APD often involves reading. Reading is essentially a auditory skill. You need to be able to hear very, very fine differences between speech sounds. Um, that's called phonological awareness. And you have to be able to manipulate speech sounds, take them out of words, put them into words, and recognize the association between speech sounds and the grapheme, the letters of the alphabet. So that's a, often a critical part of management for APD, usually done by a speech pathologist. ANSD, again, management's occurring hopefully within the first few months after the child's born, at least it starts then. Because usually we're identifying ANSD in, in infancy. It's certainly if there's newborn hearing screening program, wherever you are, there will be children being identified uh, with ANSD uh, right at that time, early first two to three months after birth. So again, it's multidisciplinary. We've got, now we're talking otolaryngology, neurology, um, certainly medical geneticists and many, many other health professionals uh, and physicians in most cases. Counseling is also important. In fact, research shows that the average parent of a child with ANSD is quite disappointed with the counseling they get. Children with ANSD, their parents need much more counseling than your average child with a hearing loss. Close monitoring is important because we obviously can't record behavioral audiometry immediately. And we won't really know much about their ability to hear faint sounds until we perform pure tone audiometry. And that takes time. So we have to monitor very closely. Recording OAEs at each assessment is important. Some children uh, have normal OAEs throughout their childhood, children with ANSD, but others begin to lose their OAE. So we always have to monitor for outer hair cell status. The management of a child with ANSD may change if we begin to see uh, deficits in outer hair cell function as well as uh, the uh, inner hair cells or auditory nerve. Hearing aids, hearing aids actually can benefit children with ANSD. There's been mixed messages on this over the years, but now the research clearly shows that a child with ANSD properly fit with a hearing aid and with other help such as FM technology uh, can actually benefit from amplification. If they can't benefit or if they do not have aidable hearing, a cochlear implant can also help. But of course, this cochlear implantation shouldn't be done until you have clear diagnosis of ANSD and information on whether the problem is presynaptic or postsynaptic. And then very often in young children, while we're uh, kind of waiting, you might say, to get all of the test results and to determine the pattern of ANSD that this child has, something's gotta be done for them to help them communicate. And so very often alternative communication strategies are very helpful such as simple signs to communicate basic wants and needs.
I want to stress one point, and this is really important for you as otolaryngologists and audiologists. When a parent is told that their child seems to be meeting the criteria and the pattern result seems to point toward auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder, many parents view that as horrible news. If only their child had a, a traditional hearing loss affecting the ear, there's this uh, aura of this is just a horrible problem, nothing can be done about it, and children with auditory neuropathy will never learn to speak or communicate, and that is not true. Now that we can diagnose ANSD accurately, uh, and we know a little bit more about management with cochlear implants, hearing aids, etc., the outcomes of children with traditional sensory neural hearing loss affecting the hair cells versus ANSD are essentially equivalent. This is an excellent study out of Sydney, Australia, showing that properly managed children with sensory neural hearing loss and properly managed children with ANSD will have good outcomes. And they're indistinguishable outcomes. So this is very positive uh, news for any the parents of any child with ANSD. Okay. I want to make sure we had time for questions, and we certainly do. So uh, let me just uh, make some general concluding comments, and then we'll go to questions. Any of you who have are in a clinic setting, you're, if you're seeing children, particularly in a medical center environment, you are seeing children who might have APD. And if you're seeing children with hearing loss, you definitely are seeing some children with ANSD, whether you know it or not. So it's really critical for you to have, be vigilant, always uh, on the alert, using these risk factors, using the proper initial tests, OAEs, acoustic reflexes, to identify ANSD as soon as possible. If you're seeing an older pediatric population or even an adult population, you still may be encountering patients with undiagnosed ANSD. And certainly around the world, in certain parts of the world, there are adults walking around with very poor communication, what appears to be a hearing loss, but they're not wearing hearing aids, they're not benefiting from any intervention for the hearing loss because they really have ANSD and it's not been diagnosed. Now, let's talk about APD for a moment. Every audiologist seeing children or adults will be encountering patients with APD, again, whether they're aware of it or not. The prevalence of APD, the estimated prevalence in children is just the general population. It's around 3%, which is actually three, 10 times higher than the prevalence of severe uh, or moderate to severe bilateral peripheral hearing loss. And in adults, APD is not uncommon. If you have an adult who uh, struggled in school, uh, maybe never reached their full potential, is maybe having trouble in work, maybe they've been referred by vocational rehabilitation, they just can't seem to hold down a job, consider APD. Certainly any veteran or any other patient, civilian, who's had a traumatic brain injury is at great risk for APD. Any older adult coming into your clinic where there are con concerns about con uh, cognitive decline, perhaps even dementia, almost always should be evaluated for APD. In fact, one of the most, the earliest indicators, uh, it's even a preclinical indicator of dementia, such as Alzheimer's dementia, is difficulty with speech perception and noise. So by just being alert to the possibility that your patients might have these two problems, recognizing the risk factors and taking some simple diagnostic steps, you can provide these patients with an incredible benefit. And if you're not uh, comfortable with or don't want to be involved in the full diagnosis and management, there are plenty of audiologists and other specialists who can do that for you. Okay, so that's my pep talk and I hope it's been clear. I hope it's been clinically useful. Um, and I hope, I hope it pays off as you begin to evaluate uh, patients in your clinic in the days to come. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.